Our final two presenters are Christian Oppie and Dahlia Wasfi. Christian Oppie is a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts. Born in Georgia in 1955, Oppie went to college in the mid-1970s in the wake of the Vietnam generation. He is the author of Working Class War, American Soldiers in Vietnam, and American Soldiers in Vietnam and Patriots, the Vietnam War Remembered from All Sides. Hi, I'm Chris Oppie. Uh, it really is an honor to be with all of you here uh, today, and I hope uh, my words can do some justice to the occasion. You know, in the, in the years after the Vietnam War, many Americans believed that one of the central lessons um, of the war was that never again should our foreign policy be so aggressive, never again should the policymakers be so uh, unaccountable to Congress and the public. And in the future, we really had to open up uh, our foreign affairs to uh, more democratic input. Well, unfortunately, in the 30 years since that war, and especially in more recent years, the institutions of American power have, have taken a very different lesson from the Vietnam War. And our foreign policy has become uh, even less democratic, more secretive, and more unaccountable. Uh, so we're left with the, these very depressing realities. Uh, now entering our sixth year uh, of this military engagement, which is our second longest uh, since independence. So I'm sure you, like, uh, like me, listening to this testimony, uh, are searching a bit for some basis uh, for hope. Uh, and uh, I want to talk a bit about that. I found myself during the last couple of days thinking a lot about the uh, extraordinary image painted by Pablo Picasso in 1937, uh, one of the great anti-war paintings of the 20th century, Guernica, uh, which was uh, to depict this small Spanish town that was leveled by fascist bombing. Uh, it renders, it's a picture rendering uh, civilians and animals uh, uh, destroyed by this bombing. It is necessarily and properly a very bleak uh, and depressing uh, image, but if you, you look at it closely, you will see that uh, in the bottom of that pe picture there, there is uh, a small flower growing out uh, of the wreckage. Uh, there is some basis for hope, uh, even in the most dire times. And I would have to say to you that uh, being here uh, does give me some hope, and that the testimony of these veterans uh, is what that hope is based upon. The, the courage uh, they have shown in trying uh, to make some meaning out of their experience, and more than that, uh, collectively to try to bring an end to this war, uh, truly does offer some hope. You know, in 1971, the Vietnam veterans against the war uh, energized and inspired an anti-war movement that was becoming increasingly divided and dispirited. And so too now, uh, these veterans are bringing uh, inspiration and energy uh, to the anti-war movement. I find some hope as well in the effort to try to clarify the mechanisms uh, that produce war and have prolonged this occupation, the kinds of economic, military, and ideological uh, forces uh, that bring us to this point. Racism is, of course, uh, a very important and undeniable uh, feature of this war, yet hardly talked about uh, in the mass media. Even oil probably gets more of a mention uh, than racism. Uh, it has been a force that has shaped all of our wars, at least internally, and most of our foreign wars, particularly uh, our wars against four Asian enemies over the last century. Indeed, the racist epithet gook probably has its origins going all the way back to the war against the Philippines uh, 110 uh, years ago. Uh, as has been eloquently stated by a few of the panelists here, uh, while we all have responsibility for racism and its roots are incredibly deep, uh, it really does uh, come from the top in very important ways. Because while all of us uh, 
share certain prejudices and maybe even uh, some racist thoughts. Racism does not really become virulently violent unless it is given sanction by the state and by the powerful. Uh, and it has been given sanction and license from the very top in uh, this occupation. George Bush may not, as far as I know, have uttered the word haji uh, in public, but virtually everything he's said about the war uh, creates the groundwork for racist thinking. His description of the world in black and white terms, uh, good versus evil, uh, you're either for us or you're for the terrorist. He paints great swaths of the globe uh, in the language of um, civilization versus barbarism, uh, clearly depicting uh, an enemy world of inferiors uh, that certainly fuels uh, the racism that has been discussed uh, here today. I've been particularly moved by hearing so many of the testifiers describe their motives for going into the military, how, how deeply they wanted to do uh, good uh, and to serve their country uh, and to uh, help the Iraqi people. Uh, of course, they were lied to by the most powerful. Uh, Cheney, you'll recall, said that we would be greeted as liberators when we uh, entered Iraq. Uh, others said that it would be a, a cakewalk, that we would be developing democracy. Uh, these veterans are telling us a very different story. They were greeted not as liberators, but as uh, invaders and as uh, imperialist occupiers. These circumstances of counterinsurgency warfare and occupation are a kind of perfect recipe uh, for producing violence against civilians and non-combatants. And we heard a lot about that in the panels on rules uh, of engagement. A recipe for inflaming hostility on all sides. But you know, the people that create this policy are really not taking the responsibility for civilian loss. Quite the opposite. Uh, they blame it on uh, the very people uh, that we have heard from. This, they say, is a, a, an exceptional kind of event, uh, marginal to our main effort and the, and the work of a few bad uh, apples. These policymakers put our military personnel not only in deep physical jeopardy, often with not even sufficient supplies and armor, uh, but they put them in a kind of moral jeopardy in which they were put in sort of an impossible situation and asked to do the right thing and given a set of rules and a card and then told that, well, uh, if all else fails, uh, do what you think is necessary and we'll back you up, maybe, after you have responded, made your own decisions about what's necessary for us. What I guess I, I most want to emphasize is that we are, uh, we are all tainted uh, by this war, not just uh, these veterans. And war... <laughs> war brutalizes us all. There may be sitting here uh, today uh, veterans and, and, and people elsewhere uh, in the country and around the world who listen to some of these accounts and think to themselves, well, um, I really have nothing to add to this testimony. I didn't uh, commit, uh, I, I didn't uh, kill anyone, I didn't torture anyone, I didn't rape anyone, I didn't even see anybody do that. Uh, what can I possibly add to this testimony? Well, plenty. Uh, because just being in these circumstances, as I say, can, can be brutalizing. I'll tell just uh, one quick story from my work on the Vietnam War. Uh, I interviewed a man named Wayne Smith, an African-American medic who's been a supporter, actually, of IVAW. Uh, he said that during uh, training, he made a promise to himself that when he got to Vietnam, whatever else happened, he would never use the word gook, because he fully understood 
how quickly a word like that could be turned upon him. But he said, really, within a short time in Vietnam, after uh, being in combat and uh, seeing some of his comrades die, he broke his promise. And he used the word. And he lives with the pain and the guilt of that uh, to this day. There are many stories like that. They're not uh, uh, big and bloody atrocity stories, but they're stories of the various ways in which war can brutalize people. Uh, I've interviewed uh, veterans from the Vietnam War who still to this day beat themselves over the, uh, up over the fact that they uh, saw someone hit by a truck. They witnessed it uh, and didn't speak out against it, or saw a villager beaten up and didn't say anything. And we've heard accounts like that in the last uh, few days. These accounts, these testimonies, are crucial, not just because uh, they um, teach us how brutalizing war can be uh, for everyone, and not just because they give people who tell these stories an opportunity um, to purge themselves uh, or to try to free themselves of guilt. That's really the least of it. Uh, these stories are important because they bring uh, new purpose uh, to people who have felt very little purpose uh, in the actions they have been ordered uh, to undertake. And they're important because uh, they show all of us how the responsibility uh, belongs increasingly up the ladder uh, of the chain of the command and lies uh, ultimately and primarily at the very top. But those stories have to be repeated again and again uh, for them to be acknowledged uh, as commonplace. Finally, uh, if we really are uh, to uh, end this war, and to end future wars, uh, we really are going to have to make much more fundamental uh, changes. And I think this conference has pointed the way towards some of them. One of the most basic, easily expressed, but most difficult to achieve uh, is uh, to try to build a world in, in which uh, all human life is valued as equally important. And, and lives that cross national and tribal boundaries, uh, the human life uh, that, that crosses the lines of race and religion, and of course the lines of gender uh, and sexuality. Uh, that uh, is a kind of globalization uh, that would uh, truly be worth struggling for. Thank you. We have one final presenter, and then, if, we, if time allows, I'd like to give uh, Chris perhaps an opportunity to finish, um, if you'd like to um, wrap up some final thoughts. But before then, we're going to hear from uh, Dahlia Wasfi, who is an internationally known speaker and activist, born in the United States to an American Jewish mother and an Iraqi Muslim father. She lived in Iraq as a child, returning to the U.S. at age five. After graduating from Swarthmore College with a B.A. in biology in 1993, she earned her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997. Dr. Wasfi has made two trips to Iraq to visit her extended family since the 2003 shock and awe invasion, including a three-month stay in Basra in the spring of 2006. Based on her experiences, Dr. Wasfi is speaking out in support of immediate, unconditional withdrawal of American forces from Iraq and the need to end the occupation from the Nile to the Euphrates. And she has a website which... <laughs> Dr. Wasfi's website is www.liberatethis.com. www.liberatethis.com. Dr. Wasfi. Thank you so much.
edge. Can, is this mic working? That mic. Go away. How about this? Oh, okay. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of a mess. Um, I've watched as much as I could uh, in the past couple of days. Um, and uh, I'm doing better now than I was a couple hours ago, but, uh, and I think I should be all right, but please bear with me. Um, and uh, I always have to keep in check, and this is something I've learned in my work in the last three and a half years, that um, as uh, I, I rail against racism and I rail against dehumanization, and then I catch myself um, committing those things that uh, I abhor so much. So um, if I, uh, I, I don't know where I'm gonna go. I have a lot of um, anger and frustration and um, uh, I believe directed at the right people and that would be um, that Capitol Hill building um, not too far away. Um, Oh, that was just a gimme applause. Um, but, um, and I do want to apologize, I've just, I, I missed two radio interviews today, thanks to KPFA for inviting me to be on the show, and I totally missed it. Um, and I missed another interview, but anyway, uh, I, I hope my frustration comes out in, in the right way, and uh, um, uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, if it, you could bring up my slides, please. Um, it's kind of funny that, uh, uh, well, not funny, but it's been repeatedly said today in the testimony that uh, people keep getting the, uh, when you're in Iraq, you keep getting the wrong house when you're looking for terrorists. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> The guy there will know where to find Dick Cheney. <laughs> now, um, let me start with, uh, I'm just gonna start with a quote that I'm still trying to figure out. Um, and sometimes I'm the one saying it, and sometimes I think I'm the one it should be said to. Um, stated by an Aboriginal activist in Queensland, Australia in the 1970s, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. I just want to open up with that. Next slide. This is a picture of Rachel Corey. Um, and let's see if I can get through this one. Um, Rachel Corey, oh, you know her. <laughs> um, you heard about um, my degrees and, um, and my uh, education, and, and pretty much all that means at this point is that I'm in an incredible amount of debt. Um, but uh, it was September 2002, uh, and there were a few things falling apart in my life at that time. And it wasn't helping that my government was preparing to invade the country of my dad's origin. Um, and at that time, I took leave from my uh, residency uh, in anesthesiology, and uh, I've yet to go back. Uh, but uh, I was uh, very frustrated, very uh, hopeless, very depressed, and uh, was really seeking for uh, a reason to continue. Um, and it was around that time that I, uh, well, as the build up to the invasion continued. Um, now, when after September 11th uh, happened, uh, the anti-Arab, anti-Muslim racism in my work environment um, escalated significantly at Georgetown University Hospital. Um, and, uh, and there were a number of different responses that could have possibly taken place after that. On one extreme, you would have our government's response, which would be to invade Afghanistan and build an oil pipeline to the Caspian Sea. And on the other end, I would say, um, would be what Rachel did. Next slide. And Rachel, uh, at the time, in March 2003, was a 23-year-old college student who, after September 11th, wanted to learn about other cultures, wanted to explore the world and try to understand what was going on. And she uh, trained with the International Solidarity Movement and went to uh, Rafa in Gaza, which is uh, one of the most uh, dangerous places uh, for people living there uh, because of the brutal occupation there. And uh, tomorrow is March 16th, 2003. No, it's March 16th, and five years ago on March 16th, 2003. 
uh, Rachel was uh, with her friends in the ISM doing one of the things they do, which is to uh, basically act as human shields to defend international law. And on that day, as you see in this picture, uh, and um, yeah, the, she was uh, trying to prevent a house demolition, uh, which over 60,000 homes have been demolished uh, in the last few years in uh, occupied Palestine, which is illegal. Uh, this was the home of a Palestinian pharmacist and his family. And uh, the Israeli soldiers came driving an American D9 Caterpillar bulldozer. Uh, tax-free gift from, uh, from you and me. Uh, the first bulldozer came and uh, Rachel, as you see in her orange flak jacket and megaphone, uh, was quite visible and she was able to deter the first bulldozer. Next one. But a second one came and after a three and a half hour standoff, I don't think Rachel ever expected what would happen next. And the uh, Israeli soldier, who was probably younger than she was, mowed her down kept the blade down of the bulldozer and backed up over her. And Rachel had not expected that uh, she had seen what the Israelis were doing to the Palestinians living in Gaza, but she didn't think that they would change and do something to a Westerner, to an American, to someone who had light features. Um, next slide. But unfortunately, uh, Rachel was crushed to death that day. The worst part of it is that uh, she was awake the whole time because when her friends got to her, she said, my back is broken, and those were her last words. So in March 2003, so that's five years ago tomorrow, I was looking for a reason to stick around, and I was so angry with whatever power might be <laughs> that, hey, <laughs> I'm still here, and you took away this beautiful spirit who had all these things going for her and who could have turned a blind eye to the horrors of the world. She could have lived the American dream. And she chose to go 10,000 miles away um, to learn about people she didn't even know. And I know she didn't plan to die that day, but she gave her life literally standing up for what she believed in. And she's one of the reasons I'm still here today. And I thought, fine. If you took Rachel, well, I can stick around. And if she went to go see people she didn't even know, then maybe I should go see my family who I haven't seen in 27 years. So that was the start of my activism. And Rachel is um, the example that I tried to live up to. And it's the example that I've seen today and all the panelists and yesterday. And so, I knew I wouldn't get through her story, so. Um, anyway, that's, um, this is what an American hero looks like. And these are what American heroes look like, not because they put on a uniform and picked up a weapon, but, but because they put it down and stood up for the truth. that story and now I'm gonna move on to what I'm supposed to talk to you about okay next slide <laughs> okay enough about you let's talk about me these are my parents uh, my father originally from Basra Iraq uh, born and raised there and uh, did well enough at Baghdad University College of Sciences to earn a government scholarship to do his studies overseas he came to the United States actually to the DC area and where he met another graduate student, a nice Jewish girl from New York. And so, yeah, funny. Um, <laughs> you know, basically, the take-home message here, and while the groups of Arabs and Jews are not mutually exclusive, there are Arab Jews. Um, uh, my mother's Ash Ashkenazi Jew, and with an Arab father and Jewish mother, I am 100% Semite. So this being the Semite, yes, this being the topic on racism, you can insult either side of my family, and that would be anti-Semitic, but there's no Q&A here, so let's move on. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, uh, my parents were married in 68, had my sister in 69, and then their lives dramatically improved when I came along. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy over what's happening here um, this weekend, but I think even those individuals who are protesting the truth outside can agree that I was a very cute baby. Very cute baby right here. <laughs> Now the reason, I thank you, thank you. Um, the reason I'm showing this slide is not just for the um, gratuitous applause, but I appreciate that. Um, from the, for any of us, the uh, memories we have of our childhood from the time before our brains could make memories are from the pictures. And when I was little, in order for my dad to pay back that government scholarship he was on, he taught at Busser University for five years. So the first five years of my life were between Iraq and New York. So this is me at six months old. I don't remember this picture being taken, but when you talk to me about Iraq, this is the image I think of. But unfortunately, thanks to very effective dehumanization in the American media, next slide, this is what people think of. Swarthy, dark, mustached, evil man, dictator worse than Hitler. Now, I'm not going to defend the regime. There's no question about the ruthlessness of the dictatorship. But we have to remember that pick any country around the world, and it's made up of families. And it's those families who pay the price for what happens. Next. Oh, there's a quick blurb for me. OK, next. <laughs> so just defining it, racism is the belief that race accounts for differences in human character or ability, and that a particular race is superior to others. Uh, or it's discrimination or prejudice based on race, denial of the other's humanity. We do not respect them as human beings. And any one of us can define an other. Now, I, don't, I can't be sure if that's what was happening yesterday, but I thought it was very interesting in the discussion yesterday of Blackwater. It was a distinction that I think we in this room could make that we are not Blackwater. And we were, I was, happy to applaud that they were being uh, uh, brought to justice for the crimes of September 17, 2007. We have to remember, it doesn't make much difference to uh, the Iraqi people who's firing the weapons that kill their families. Um, but anyway, I just want to point that out for, you know, defining the other. Next. So we already talked about uh, dehumanization of the enemy, the names uh, used in Vietnam for the Vietnamese people. I know the number 58,000, but it wasn't until recently that I knew that over 3 million Vietnamese were killed during that time. And the same goes for Iraq. We've already heard the names used. Uh, it's now uh, over 1.2 million and counting as we speak. Um, it's also important to point out that uh, we condemn Saddam Hussein, and rightly so, for allegedly killing 300,000 over 30 years. We have now more than quadrupled the number in under five. Now, we're all about winning in this country, but this was not a contest we wanted to win. Basically, for that other, lives are disposable. Next. Just very briefly, I will touch on, um, and I'm not really the expert on it, I just want to touch on uh, racism within the military. Uh, uh, for example, um, Mexican families who want to come here to, oh, I'm going to have to hurry. No, I'm going to take more time. Um, who want to come here to build uh, a better life for themselves. If they are caught at the border without papers, they're going to be detained uh, or maybe beaten. They're going to be sent back home. However, if you choose to enlist in the U.S. military to be deployed overseas for corporate profit, they will accelerate your citizenship application. Give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, and we will put them in the military and send them overseas to die for Halliburton. Next slide. Now, in this slide, this is, uh, this is <laughs> citizenship. Welcome to America at al Fao Palace, Baghdad. Now, if you look at this picture, the guy in the middle is the general, and all the brown people are the new citizens. <laughs> You notice that the immigrants who get accelerated, uh, it indicates that it's not Irish immigrants who need accelerated uh, uh, citizenship. Not Europeans, <clears throat> mostly from minority areas. Next. Disposable Iraqis, again, disposable, designed to be used once and then thrown away. General Tommy Franks in 2003. We don't do body counts. 
I mean, they don't even count the number for the, the Pentagon doesn't even count the number of American dead accurately. We shouldn't expect, if they're not going to do that, we're not going to expect any better for Iraqis. Colin Powell. Colin Powell was mentioned yesterday, Joint Chiefs, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the first Gulf War. Colin Powell said, civilian Iraqi casualties, it's really not a number I'm terribly interested in. Now, it was referred, he was referred to as being um, respected. Colin Powell is a liar. He was a tool that was used to get us into Iraq. At the time that we were getting ready to invade Iraq, the Guernica that Dr. Appi referred to, the Guernica picture at the UN had to be covered. The whole point was to put it there to avoid war, but they covered it up at the backdrop. Um, and Colin Powell got his start. He, uh, was, uh, he had a desk job during the Vietnam War. It was his job to do cover-ups uh, of massacres like Me Lai and uh, everything else that went on. So no love from Dahlia for Colin Powell. Next slide. We have to stay and help. There is an element of white man's burden in this. How are these people going to wander through the desert without us? And this is, I'm telling you, this is not, uh, I'm not going to blame the, the right on the, uh, for this. This is mostly, uh, I, I will hear this in the progressive community. I know we have to leave, but I'm just afraid of what will happen when we go. Next slide. Okay, we have less than 300 years of history. And, and I don't even know how much of that you can count as democracy, okay? If you've seen our last few elections. They have more than 7,000 years of civilization. Who needs whose help? What if Iraqis spoke Oxford English, which some of them do, doesn't matter. What if Iraqis were a 94% Christian country instead of 94% Muslim? What if Iraqis were white? There was a comment made yesterday, and I really, I'm so happy I had the chance to um, speak to the veteran uh, before this session. And um, what I took from the statement was that uh, Iraqis have a, a different culture with different morals. And what I walked away from that with was that somehow that we had better morals in this country than they do. But um, for myself and for him, I wanted to clarify that um, even the, what, the brainwashing that you go through in the military can kick in in a moment of stress, which believe me, this is a moment of stress. Um, and uh, that's kind of the attitude that was presented, but um, it was, um, we had a really good conversation, so just to clarify that it is a different way of doing things, and the point was we have no right to impose ourselves onto anybody else. Next slide. Um, I know I'm out of time. I'm going to use the next five minutes if I could. Are you okay with me doing that? That's fine. Thank you. Um, uh, Anti-Arab, anti-Muslim racism. Um, basically, as we've heard, when I was growing up, the images in the media, camel jockeys, oil sheiks, and terrorists. This has been harvested over decades. I know in the earlier panel uh, it was said that it didn't just happen when you got to Iraq. This has been happening since you were born. If you go to certain movies, started in the 80s, Eddie Murphy movie, Best Defense, Delta Force, Rules of engagement, which put guns, weapons in the hands of Arab children, programming Americans that it's okay to kill, they are armed. Rendition, The Kingdom, any episode of 24. Even in Aladdin, children's movie, this, the movie opens with uh, the scene that says, where they cut off your nose to spite your face, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. So when the kids go to watch that movie, then they can go home and play video games of Desert Storm, Call of Duty, or Rainbow Six, where everything is an Arab terrorist. Next. Why is this so uh, throughout the media? There is an agenda at play to only perpetrate the negative stereotypes of Arabs and Muslims. And that is our relationship with Israel, in contrary to international law. The reason, I'm so, 
I'm so grateful for your support and applause, but um, you're taking my time. Um, <laughs> um, the, I, the reason that I'm bringing this up is that my job here was to put into context the racism that's happening. And we also need to put into context what's happening in Iraq. It is an extension of the 60-year occupation of Palestine. That is what's going on here. It's much bigger than 2001 or 2003. There are joint American-Israeli operations in occupied Palestine, in occupied Iraq. Ours is a blind military, political, and financial support that can own, that is the only reason that the Israelis and the Israeli government can continue to do what they do. That's why Rachel's story was buried. Three days later, shock and awe began in Iraq. It's in order, as the same as we've heard, to control the resources of Western Asia. Next slide. So just an idea of these people have been fighting each other for thousands of years? No. Really just since the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians happened since 1948. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, and the same thing in Iraq. They've been killing, even I hear some progressives, they've been killing themselves for thousands of years. No, really just since 2003. Next slide. Uh, we heard testimony that uh, crowd control in, uh, that uh, the MPs were using in Iraq, concussion grenades, projectile beanbags, rubber bullets. Who did we learn that from? That's Israeli crowd control in Palestine. And there are connections, high-level connections between the U.S. Army and Israelis. This is supposed to be non-lethal, uh, non-lethal ammunition. Well, a rubber bullet, which is a steel bullet coated with rubber, is lethal when it's lodged in a child's brain. Next slide. Why don't we know what's actually happening? Just briefly, I will show you why because of the messages in the media. Next slide. This was a study done in 2004 called Deadly Distortion. Check out the website, ifamericansnew.org. Associated Press coverage of Israeli and Palestinian deaths. Associated Press. This is not an obscure uh, uh, news, news reporting agency. I will focus on the reporting of children's deaths. The AP reported Israeli children's deaths more often than the deaths occurred, but omitted any coverage of 85% of Palestinian children killed. This is not a mistake. This is not an aberration. This is an agenda. This is a policy. Next slide. The reason for this, and I will show you, in 2004, the actual number of Israeli children who died because of the actions of a Palestinian, eight. The actual number of Palestinian children who died because of the actions of an Israeli, most often IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, was 179. What did we see in the media? The next graph. 113% reporting of the Israeli children's deaths because they appeared in more than one headline or more than one article. That's, the, you know, that's fine. But what happened was only 15% of these Palestinian children's deaths were reported. So that's why we have a distorted view. Let me be perfectly clear with my 100% Semitic background. I am not saying that the eight Israeli deaths don't matter. I am saying that the 179 Palestinian deaths do. And unless we know what's being done in our name, we're not going to bring an end to this, and we have to. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you. I'm almost done. Now, why would the AP do this? Okay. I think this might be a good time to segue into, uh, into Chris's comments, if that's okay. Okay, next slide. Let me, I'll do the last slide. Okay, so the billions of dollars going to the Israelis, including one billion, and in 2005, the veterans' health care budget was one billion dollars short. Next slide. Uh, and I do want to address this because of racism. This is what Muhammad Ali said. No, I am not going 10,000 miles to help murder, kill, and burn other people to simply help continue the domination of white slave masters over dark people the world over. This is the day and age when such evil injustice must come to an end. No Viet Cong ever called me names. Freedom means being able to follow your religion, but it also means carrying the responsibility to choose between right and wrong. So thank you, IVAW. So when the time came for me to make up my mind about going in the army, I knew people were dying in Vietnam for nothing, and I should live by what I thought was right. And now the whole world knows that. That was 40 years ago. This is today. You guys lead. We will follow. Thank you so much.